First of all, thank you to everyone who stayed till the very end of Friday. You are serious about these topics, and we so appreciate that. I'm going to speak with you today about the power of empathic curiosity in a divided world. Take a look at this picture. What do you see? Everyone think for yourself, what do you see in this picture? Before COVID-19, you would probably just see people on a bus. But of course, with COVID-19 and masking, one of the things we see that we never noticed before is that we all breathe the same air. And just as we all breathe the same air, we need to be aware that we also catch each other's moods, each other's feelings. Emotions are contagious. And we are not aware of how much this affects our society. Now, this whole week, you've heard about social problems of in inequality, divided politics with, with hatred, and all of these things have been really brought into relief and been made more obvious during COVID-19. But what I want to share with you today is that there's emotional fallout on our lives as individuals, which we know, stress, epidemic stress, loneliness, mental health problems, but the same capacity that makes us vulnerable as individuals, makes us have individual superpowers. I think I got that, good. We have the power as individuals to take actions which can improve not only our relationships, our families, and our immediate communities, but even change the world. Remember that climate action began as a grassroots movement, and similarly, we can as individuals collectively work together to improve our social world from the bottom up as well as the top down. I'm still getting this right. I'm trying to, yes, okay. As a psychiatrist, philosopher, and researcher, I want to share with you an action that any one of us, all of us here can take, which can help turn conflicts into positive change, the change that you want to see. I've learned about it from working with doctors and patients over many years, and also studying larger societal conflicts. And it will sound simple, but it does take practice and commitment. This action is to see the person that you are fighting with, that you are having a conflict with, as someone that you need. And you need them to learn about, they need to tell you about their world and their thoughts so you need to learn how to approach rather than avoid conflicts and to ask the person, again, who you are in a conflict with, ask them open questions like, tell me more. What is it that's bothering you so much about what I'm doing? And you need to listen with genuine curiosity to seek to discover what you don't already know about that person's perspective. I call this listening with empathic curiosity. And the phrase empathic curiosity is not a common one and might not even sound meaningful yet, but hopefully by the end of my talk it will be very meaningful. But to begin with, I use the word empathy, it's empathic curiosity. And so I ask you each to think in your mind, what is empathy? Think to yourself, when you think of empathy, what do you think of? What most people think of is emotions. They think of empathy as the same thing as sympathy or compassion, because all three are feelings that you have for another person, and they're all, in fact, similar in one way. There's a section of the brain that's the basis of emotional empathy, sympathy, and compassion, which is based on our brain's capacity to mimic other people's emotions or resonate with other people's emotions. So if you're talking with someone who's sad, you might suddenly feel automatic sadness. That's the basis of emotional empathy, sympathy, and compassion. But empathy is different. In addition to that emotional part of the brain, it also involves a thinking part of the brain, a second brain system that helps you think about and imagine what another person is thinking. And that capacity is not there for sympathy or compassion, only for empathy. 
So we can imagine another person's thoughts and feelings. We can just cognitively imagine it without feeling anything from the inside out. Why do we need this capacity? Because we cannot directly observe another person's motives or their psychology from the outside in. And for survival, we need to know why other people are doing what they're doing. So we have this very developed capacity to imagine another person's thoughts and motives. And this is extremely important to this day because each person is a different world. Every person, whatever they say, sees and feels things based on their personal history. And without curiosity, the only way you can relate to other people is by making assumptions about them and their motives. And those assumptions are very often wrong. For example, if I'm working with someone and they rush me too much, I'm going to assume this person is really rude. But it could be that they're just really worried because they want to get home quickly because they have a sick loved one. I don't know that if I'm not curious about why they're doing what they're doing. Empathic curiosity is the desire to understand another person's motives with increased accuracy. Now why, oops, why is empathic curiosity so useful during conflicts when you're fighting with other people? Why? Conflicts make us angry and defensive. Sympathy and compassion evaporate. They just go poof. Empathic curiosity, the cognitive part, gives us an alternative cognitive pathway. When we are angry or upset with another person, we're actually built to become curious about the source of our pain. We are evolutionary built. When we're happy through evolution, we don't become curious. We just eat and look at the sky. But in evolution, when we're in pain, we become very curious about our situation and what the cause of our pain is. When another person is the cause of our pain, we are naturally built to become curious and say, why are they doing this? Well, that is a superpower. You can take that power and actually ask them <laughs> and try to find out, why are you doing this? And if the person sees that you are trying to understand them more accurately and not just pretending to listen, this is so powerful to de-escalate conflicts. It will also empower you to negotiate, as I'll show. So now let me share stories with you from my experience as a psychiatrist in a general hospital and also later on as a person working in larger societal conflicts. Okay, this is, these are actual clinical consults that I've done. Uh, the pictures are not the real people, but the stories are completely real. I was called to see a patient who was an 18-year-old college athlete, let's call him Ron, because he had Crohn's disease, which is a disease of the colon or intestine, and it had flared up so badly that he was, his whole intestines were inflamed, and he would die within hours if a big part of his, his intestines were not removed. So he needed emergency surgery to save his life. And the, the doctors told him, if we do this, you can have pretty good health and a normal lifespan, but you have to have an external colostomy bag. You have to have an external bag to, to take the waste from your colon. And Ron said, I don't want the surgery. I won't have it. So they called me, and I went, and I saw his parents frantic beside his bedside and the medical team telling him, you know, you need to have the surgery or you'll die. And Ron just kept telling them, I don't want surgery because I don't want a life in which I can't be active. So they told him, oh, you can do so many other sports. You can't play football, but you can swim, you can do these sports, you can be, have a full, normal life. No, I don't want to have a life if I'm not active. Finally, an, an experienced nurse kicked us all out of the room and said, let me just talk to him alone. And she said to him, I don't get it. What do you mean by not being active? And he told her that he was concerned he couldn't be sexually active. And she said, oh, I've seen so many patients with colostomies have sex, have romances, get married. And he immediately calmed down, accepted the surgery. Empathic curiosity saved his life. Here's another one, and I have many. I'll just tell you one other clinical story. 
30-year-old Sam was blocking the door of his dying mother's room, her hospital room, and he was threatening to shoot the nurses if they went into her room to give her any more pain medication. So they emergently called psychiatry. They always call us when someone's dangerous. I always go with a big guard to make sure the person doesn't have a gun first. Actually, the first time I ever went, I went without a guard, and my husband said to me, what, you're going to go and get shot? First make sure the person doesn't have an active gun. But anyway, once we saw he wasn't actually going to shoot anyone right then, I could feel comfortable talking with him. And he told me that, and what I haven't told you is, his, I think I said his mother had metastatic cancer. So she was dying. She was at the end stage of dying from metastatic cancer. And she was in terrible pain. She needed the pain medication. But some of you know that at the end of life, when you get enough pain medication, it puts you to sleep. And she probably would never have been awake again after that. And so he said to me, I can't lose contact with her. If they give her the medication, I'll lose contact with my mother. And he was frantic. And he told me how he had not slept for days and how he had carried his mother's, she was very skinny at this point from cancer, he had physically carried her in his arms out of two other hospitals when they tried to give her sedating pain medication. And he said he just needed to have contact with her as long as possible. And I became curious because it was obvious to me that this was not a crazy man in general and that he really loved his mother and that his mother was in pain. And so I wondered, how serious is it for him that he can't let her have what she needs? So I said, what is it about losing contact with her that you can't face, that is unbearable to you? And as soon as he saw that I was genuinely curious, he immediately dropped his whole threatening attitude, and his shoulders slumped, and he started to cry. And he told me that about a year ago, right around the time his mother was diagnosed with cancer, he had gotten the job of his dreams far across the country, and he had chosen to move across the country and not see his mother because he believed that she would have a good outcome or hoped she would have a good outcome from her cancer. And he found it unbearable that he had lost that year with her. And as he cried, he was calmer. We called his father. His father was an elderly man who was staying away because he was so threatened by the son. And the father and the son sat by the mother's bedside as we gave her the pain medication and she went to sleep. Experiences like this led me to study the power of empathic curiosity, wondering what is the person doing? Why are they saying the things they're saying? And what power does that have in medical care? So I began 10 years of research on doctors and patients to see when these curiosity moments could make a difference in medical care. And one of the first things that I saw was that there weren't a lot of them because doctors were not asking patients about their feelings, their thoughts, why they were doing what they were doing. This was in the late 90s, early 2000s, and doctors were not asking patients to really tell them anything about themselves. Doctors at that time thought that their job was to give orders. They tell patients what to do, patients are supposed to do it. There was really very little empathic curiosity. The effect of that on patients was that patients did not trust doctors. Because since the doctor, oh, and I have to tell you, the doctors were also believed, literally believed that empathy would make them a bad doctor. They felt, they believe, first of all, they believed that, I talked about empathic curiosity, they thought I just meant feelings of empathy. And they said, if I feel empathy, I won't be objective, and I'll burn out. So they were scared of the whole thing. And what they did instead is, in this very distanced way, tell patients what to do. So patients felt the doctors weren't really interested or curious about them, and the patients wouldn't ask the questions they needed to when the doctor told them complicated things and the patient didn't understand, when they told them to take medications the patients didn't want to take and they didn't understand. Patients didn't trust the doctors, so they didn't ask, and they didn't act authentically with the doctors. So they would leave the session with the doctor, and this is true across the U U.S. at this time, and 50% of what doctors recommended, 50%, half, would be thrown away the minute the patient left the doctor because of this lack of trust. So we began meeting with doctors in small groups to try to disrupt this cycle, this negative cycle. 
in the small groups, we, we first of all had curiosity about the doctors. We asked them, what is it that you want? Why are you coming to the small group? Do you realize, you know, do you, what do you find frustrating about being a doctor? And they told us it's frustrating that half of what I recommend isn't, isn't followed. And also, all these conflicts with patients. I don't know what to do. So we began to help them see that part of the conflicts and part of the mistrust was because they were making incorrect assumptions about their patients. And they became curious. The doctors became curious about why the patients weren't taking the medication. What did the patient think? What did the patient want to know? So they became curious. And they started deliberately listening more. And as they started listening more to patients, and they started, patients started telling them their, their stories and about their lives. And this led doctors to have not only cognitive or left brain empathy, but also emotional empathy, which they had not been having. They actually were more moved by patients. And patients saw that in their face and heard the curiosity and began to trust them more. And we saw a big increase in adherence to treatment over, over the years. And we did this through peer modeling in small groups and having doctors throughout medical schools throughout the country develop a different culture. Still, the doctors did ask us at this time, this, you know, this is good now, but how do I know that all this empathic engagement, how do I know that it won't lead to burnout? So we wanted to do research on burnout. So we collaborated with research neuroscientists using MRIs, other psychological testing, and observing medical students through the years to find out what role empathic curiosity played in burnout. And what we found, well, I won't tell you what we found right away. Let me just ask you this. Which field of medicine do you think has the lowest level of burnout? Everybody think about that. If anybody wants to call it out, you can. Anybody else? Okay. All right. I think um, I heard a few good ideas, maybe very good ideas. Um, but the field of, I was surprised, the field of medicine that has the lowest level of burnout is palliative care. Palliative care is the saddest field of medicine. It's patients who are dying, who are suffering, who have intractable pain. If burnout was to come from empathy, you would think it would happen there. The reason palliative care has the lowest level of burnout is because doctors who are palliative care specialists have the highest level of empathic curiosity. They have the most skills, cognitive skills, to think about and ask questions about and understand the precise motives and needs of each patient. And they use that to channel their emotional empathy. So we developed a model of this, which is, if a doctor feels something like sympathy, empathy, just emotions with the patient, that does lead to burnout. But if they feel emotions like empathy, sympathy, resonance with the patient, but they use it to be curious about what the patient is experiencing, then they have something to do with their emotions that's very productive. So for example, as a psychiatrist, if I'm having a good day and I'm in a good mood, and I meet a patient who's very together and professional, and I sit with them and I just feel this heaviness, I realize that maybe that patient is depressed and they're hiding it. And then I can ask some questions and say, you know, have you found yourself more tired lately? And I can help them tell me. Or if I find myself feeling very anxious, sometimes it's a patient that's very scared, maybe even paranoid. Our emotional resonance with other people can be a clue to what they are feeling, but only if we use our cognitive empathy to have, not to make assumptions, but to ask questions. So again, we have these two pathways for empathy, the emotional part, but then the cognitive pathway, which gives us an alternative pathway during conflicts. So all of this was very moving to me because we helped change a culture of medicine and I started to become interested in larger societal conflicts. Around the world, in my country, in the US, here in Chile, everywhere, we live in a time where we have histories of conflict, political upheaval, 
and yet the possibility of transformation. I became very interested in working with human rights workers where there was a high level of social conflict, but there was the possibility of social reconciliation. One of the first projects I worked on was in the former Yugoslavia. Some of you that are very young might not know that there was war in Yugoslavia from 1991 to 2001. Ten years of a terrible war in which Bosnian, Serbian, and Croatian people, neighbors, basically killed each other. And then, 2002, they had to live side by side. Impossible. And there's still conflicts today. There's no magic answer. But there were groups through the years that were able to build genuine social reconciliation, and we studied them. And one of the most successful groups was a group of mothers of sons who had been killed during the war, whose bodies were not located. So the mothers of the Serbian, Croatian, and, and Bosnian mothers had to go across each other's borders looking for the bodies of their sons. So they worked as a collective over several years. And because of the ethnic fighting, at beginning time, they hated each other, but had to help each other. But what happened is as they spent so much time together, they started telling each other their stories. And they were very interested and curious about each other's lives. And eventually, they built real respect and comradeship. So, for example, two women that we interviewed, Marija and Dobrinka, told us how one of them said, uh, Marija said about Dobrinka, I don't always like her, but I respect her. And when she's in trouble, I support her. And we heard from other people that when they were in critical conflicts, these two always stood up for each other, and they built a memorial together. Okay, that's a while ago. Right now, I'm working with the city of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles wants to design a, mo a memorial for COVID-19. So they asked me and some others to consult with them about what they should do. Now, Los Angeles, it's in the news quite a bit because there's big tears in the social fabric during the pandemic. There's inequality, racism, many factors, but what's happening now is everybody's fighting everybody over resources. Frontline workers, elders, parents with children with mental health issues, everyone is mad at everybody and wants the resources. So the idea that we would build one big monument in the middle of the city as if we were all in it together was not realistic. So we said instead of putting the money for that, why don't we put the money into holding listening sessions all over the city, in the 19 districts of the city, we, and that's what we're doing. And we're holding these very creative listening sessions in which people tell each other their stories of what they lost during COVID-19, but they also share their hopes for the future. So instead of one top-down memorial, these listening sessions are helping people have multiple experiences. And we're going to weave together the stories into dynamic exhibits that will be distributed across the city and we'll hold an, a yearly day of listening. Storytelling and empathic listening are the best way to mend the social fabric. One last example from my work. Right now I'm studying the activism of people with long COVID. Some of you may know long COVID is a serious problem. There, it, it, we don't know how many will have it, but many, many people. And when you get it, you can have months to even years of dis dysfunction, where your heart doesn't function normally, your heart rate, your blood pressure. You can have severe fatigue and brain fog, not be able to work or function in your family. It's very difficult. When people started telling doctors in the medical establishment about these symptoms, the medical establishment didn't believe people. They told them, listen, it's all in your head. There were mostly women in the beginning, and they said, it's all in your head, or you should just try harder, exercise more, and all of this backfired. So people around the world with long COVID got very depressed. Some even became suicidal. But then some started blogging online and telling their story in depth. And then they started reading and listening to each other's stories and building networks. And some of the people had backgrounds in data analysis. So they started collecting data and compiling it. And then they started becoming activists and going to the governments and saying, you need to put money into research. You need to put money into clinical care. And as this slide shows, by February 2021, 
this long COVID alliance had tremendous success and in the US has gotten a lot of research funding. All of this happened from empathic listening. The next story is one of my favorites about the power of empathic curiosity to change the whole world. It's a story about Nelson Mandela. Most of you know who he is and probably a lot about him, but you may not know this story. When apartheid was still in practice in South Africa and Man Nelson Mandela was still in prison, he had been imprisoned by the South African government for over 27 years on and off. He had an opportunity as a prisoner with no really very little power to negotiate with the president of his country, F.W. de Klerk. And the negotiation was supposed to be about Mandela getting released from prison. And the reason he even got a chance to do that is because by then the international press knew about Mandela and was arguing for his release. But the negotiations were held secretly just between this prisoner and the president. Now, the fact that the press was on his side about being released, when they found out that the negotiation meant that Mandela would be released, people were not that surprised. De Klerk sort of had to do it. But when de Klerk made his other announcement, the whole world was shocked. While still in prison, Mandela got de Klerk to agree to end apartheid. He announced the end, the plan of how to end apartheid, while with a, only by negotiating with this prisoner. Since this was the most powerful negotiation anyone had ever seen, historians have studied it. And what de Klerk told people Year, over the years after, when they said, how did Mandela, he essentially got everything he asked for, how did he do it? De Klerk said, Mandela was a good listener. I want you to see that this was a big win for Mandela, but it was not a loss for de Klerk. It was a win-win, not a win-loss, because really apartheid had to end, and by listening to each other, they were being able to negotiate an ending with less violence. A mistake that we all make when we're in a conflict or in a negotiation is we think that it's a win-lose. We view conflicts as zero-sum games. I have to win over you in this conflict. I have to get you to listen to me and see my view. But professional negotiators see it just the opposite way. They know People who have to be our leaders know that what they need is a win-win. Because if you win and the other person feels like they lost, it's not going to be a stable outcome. You need stable success. And stable success has to be some kind of win-win. Well, how do you get to a win-win when people have opposite positions? You use empathic curiosity. How do I mean that? First, you use it with the other person. You find out, like, De Klerk thinks he needs this, but what does De Klerk really need? What does he really need? Maybe he doesn't need the stuff that we don't want him to have. Maybe he just needs to go down in history as the person who peacefully negotiated the end of apartheid. But you also have to have, and this is a topic I'm writing a book about, but you have to have empathic curiosity about yourself. And Mandela was really wise. If I had been put in prison by my government for 27 years, all I would want would be to humiliate them in the press. I would want revenge. But Mandela knew that wasn't his deepest need. He was curious about himself. He knew his deepest need was to make sure that after apartheid ended, there wouldn't be a lot of violence and going backwards so that his people wouldn't be killed by the people who had been taken out of power. He wanted a lasting peace. So he had to be curious about his deepest motives and de Klerk's deepest motives. Okay, now some people might raise a moral question. I'm an ethics professor, so I like moral questions. You might say, how can I negotiate like this with an enemy? How can I have empathic curiosity of someone that is treating me, violating my rights? And I want to tell you that empathic curiosity is, is important to have even when you're in the middle of an active war. You need to have empathic curiosity. Why? because empathic curiosity is strategic. It's strategic. It helps you get the, the result that you want. And that way, empathic curiosity is very different from sympathy or compassion. 
At no moment in history has Mandela ever expressed sympathy or compassion for de Klerk or the South Af African government. He had to understand their motives with the curiosity part. Even during war, we have a very uh, famous end-of-life statement by Robert McNamara, the infamous U.S. Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War. He said at the end of his life that his biggest mistake in Vietnam was that he didn't empathize with the enemy. He said if he had used empathic curiosity to picture what the other side really needed, he could have ended the war sooner and many lives could have been saved. And remember, enemies today become neighbors tomorrow. Remember Marisha and Dobrinka. I've spent my life studying empathic curiosity because it is sustainable during conflicts. Sympathy wears out. Kindness evaporates when the other person doesn't respond with kindness. But when people make no sense to us and are doing things that bother us, we are built to become curious. Now, we do need one thing. We do need to recognize that we are all connected. I talked about how we breathe the same air. I need a breath. Let's all take a breath. <sighs> Almost done with the conference today. Okay. We do need to realize that we breathe the same air. And sometimes to realize that, we need to refresh. We need to slow down. If we can, we need to go into nature or, or do art. I'm almost done. I'll say a little bit after this, but what I want to do now is read you a poem about our sharing the same air and the same world. And it's a poem because I am a visitor to Chile and because I love Pablo Neruda. It's a poem by Pablo Neruda. And you can read it while I say it. The poem is called Keeping Quiet. <clears throat> now we will count to 12, and we will all keep still. For once, on the face of the earth, let's not speak in any language. Let's stop for a second and not move our arms so much. It would be an exotic moment, without rush, without engines. We would all be together in a sudden strangeness. Fishermen in the cold sea would not harm whales, and the man gathering salt would not look at his hurt hands. Those who prepare green wars, wars with gas, wars with fire, victories with no survivors, would put on clean clothes and walk about with their brothers in the shade, doing nothing. What I want should not be confused. Oops. What I want should not be confused with total inactivity. Life is what it is all about. If we were not so single-minded about keeping our lives moving, and for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt the sadness of never understanding ourselves and of threatening ourselves with death. Now, I'll count up to 12, and you keep quiet, and I will go. This poem reminds us that we are united by a shared social atmosphere, just as we are united by a shared physical atmosphere. Poetry connects us and invites curiosity about each other's lives. Across class divides, we can see injustices we previously suppressed. We can slow down to a moment, but a moment shaped by history and pregnant with the future. Poems surprise us. They take a detour to change the way something familiar looks to us. 
This is where poetic epiphany or surprise and empathic curiosity converge. Returning to how can we improve our shared social world, we can cultivate empathic curiosity. We live with uncertainty, today so much uncertainty, about what human beings are capable of, on the good side as well as the bad. Uncertainty holds potential for growth and change. This potential to be surprised is to me the most realistic form of hope. To build a better future, we need this special form of hope. It's fine, it's the same slide. <laughs> to build a special future, we need this special form of hope, not denying conflict, but appreciating the nearly limitless capacity each of us has for empathic curiosity. We can be surprised by the layers of meaning we had not noticed before in our own and each other's lives. We can find joy in the intertwining of our private feelings and our collective human endeavor. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.